the days are getting longer and for the staff here next weekend is looming when the house and gardens have just got to be ready for the first visitors of the season. It's Tuesday morning and gardeners David and Una are starting their day with a little boating. Actually, there's weeding to be done on the island, but they're relaxed about it. Not so relaxed is Trisha Simcock. This morning she's going to train some of Lyme's many volunteer workers and it's her first time. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming this cold January, February morning. This morning we're doing um, the Welcome Host Seminar. It's showing the volunteers how to improve visitor care that they already have. It's something that the National Trust have taken on and everybody within the National Trust are doing. The course is going to run um, throughout this morning. It's going to run until about half past one when you get lunch in the tea room. For housekeepers Kay, Christine and Jane, today's first task is to take a tapestry out of store to the entrance hall for hanging. Lime's tapestries are somewhat on the large side. But there may be a change of plan and a smaller tapestry might suffice. Okay, now the idea is you're all sitting next to people that hopefully you don't know or you don't know particularly. Never met them before in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I'm going to ask you to do now is to find out about your neighbour. Throughout the year, the volunteers do a very wide range of different jobs. They man the house when the house is open. I mean, that's the, the most important. Uh, just as important, you've got the garden stewards who man the gardens and the park volunteers who either pick up litter or do conservation work. So they rebuild all our dry stone walls, put up all our fences. But then there's also the sewing volunteers who make the costumes for the education guides. And they all do a very wide range of things. Anything, really. Anything we ask them, they do. They're really good. OK, ladies and gentlemen, have you all found out something about your neighbour? <laughs> Head gardener Gary Rainford and his team inspect the orangery. We're actually now in the position now where we can actually start looking at reducing some of the plants because they've put so much height on. One of the main ones, obviously, being these two camellias up on this side wall. Um, which we believe to be two of the oldest in the country. Really nice in May, just a, a total wall of red. We still actually have to prune them to reduce them down from the ceiling. And uh, they would still be going up with us otherwise, but doing really nicely and we're quite happy with the place at the moment. Training over for one day, it's time for some volunteers to get down to the bricks and mortar, or rather, no mortar. There are dry stone walls pretty well all over the countryside from here into Derbyshire. Here we've got, what, 19 miles of walls, a lot of which are falling down. It's very much like a, a brick wall in a house. You should never really have a, two Sorry. joints together. You should move them so that, in fact, you've got a staggered joint, which then makes that rather awkward to fill down, but we'll fill that in. So what you try and avoid is having a running joint, more than two courses, otherwise the wall becomes unstable. I've always wanted to say, and this is one we cooked earlier. <laughs> right, so, we need some male assistance. Kay, Christine and Jane have employed curator Dye's expertise to get them and their tapestry out of a tight corner. I told you, but you were <laughs> We need to go this way. We're going. Okay, turn around. Yeah. We've got to get this through. It's the dining room. Okay. 
and we'll carry on with the final instalment next week on Lime Time. Meet Turban Thomas. His portrait is one of my favourites here in the house and it stands right outside the door of the library. And of course, I start off every programme talking to you from the library and then I head off down to the chapel. I thought you might like to see the route I take this week. Now, the family that originally owned this house were called the Lees and they loved those enormous mastiff dogs. There's one of the family pets there. His name was Lion. You can see why, can't you? And then another family favourite pet here. Nice looking dog, but just look, that's actually a boy, not a girl. That's Thomas Lee, presumably before he was britched. And then just round the corner here to the Bright Gallery, which is very aptly named. Look at the colour, authentic red, newly painted, of course. Lovely collection of Jacobean glass there. Wouldn't mind some of that myself. And then this is lovely, the entrance hall with its glorious 17th century tapestries. And over there, that's Francis Lee. He's the one who originally had the house built. You're not flagging, are you? One more flight of stairs down to the chapel. And here I am, barely out of breath. And Oh, a butler. Unfortunately, I think he has to stay with the house, but he's in the right colours, racing colours for Lime Park. And the last leg of the journey, round to finally join this wonderful reception committee here in, in the chapel. I mean, I suppose, what do you call a, a group of, of clergymen? A sort of gaggle? And a, a choir? <laughs> I, think, I think technically we're a chapter of clergy. Oh, right. Well, how often do you all get together? Well, we meet uh, once a month, uh, at least once a month, uh, generally to get together, just to, to chat because uh, our working together is based upon our faith and upon our friendship. So we spend time talking together, catching up on news, praying for one another, praying for the work in Disley, and, and, and having, having lunch. lunch together as so well. So I hear, who does the cooking? <laughs> oh, well, we take it in turns to, uh, to cook and uh, provide that. But we'd all reckon that, uh, that Martin always lays on the best spread. <laughs> Father Martin, I'll be around soon. Now listen, of course, all of you have been encouraging your congregations to pray for people who have written and asking for prayer. What effect has that had on the people you know? Well, they've become very much a part of our family over this, this, this few months, this month, and that we pray for them every day. At our church, we've lit a little candle every day for them, and all our churches are remembering them very much in our prayers. They're, we are by their side in their troubles and sorrows and joys. That's a tremendous comfort. Well, we'll look forward to all of you leading our prayers a little later on. But now let me introduce you to Amici, who uh, are here to sing an old favourite, although you might think we're a little ahead of ourselves. It's called All in the April Evening. <laughs>
To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to keep silent, and a time to speak. A time to love, and a time to hate. A time of war, and a time of peace. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Very exciting chairs to show. Chairs, they're right. wonderful. They really are nice. But you're going to have to help me to uncover them. You have to. Okay. The reason we take them off with two of us, if you hold it like I am, like that, like that. just lift it up so that it doesn't catch. 
on the embroidery or the chair. Now then. Right, well, that's a handsome chair, isn't, isn't it? Isn't that wonderful? Family legend is that they were by Thomas Chippendale, but we think not now. But what is interesting is the connection. The back splat here is CR, the royal cipher Carolus Rex of Charles I. They were, the family were supporters of the Stuarts. But again, what is very interesting is the seat cover. You notice it's protected with net. It's supposed to be the cloak that Charles I wore to his execution. As it is now, it doesn't look much like a cloak to me. Look at the pattern. See how the pattern narrows towards the back, up towards the top, towards the neck. The neck, yes. A brutal way to die, wasn't it? Yes, and quite chilling to find something like that in a house in Cheshire. This chair contains a memory of a dead king. King Charles was not a wise man, but he was brave and he died bravely. This cloak could link us back to his death. It bonds us to another time, to a grim morning in history. The impact of his death has echoed on. Seeing and touching this cloak makes it real to us. The deaths that matter have an impact on us which lasts all through our lives. The past returns in feel and smell and touch. When someone dies, it is their clothes, a hairbrush, an old purse, a signet ring, which makes them vivid. Through their things, we want to believe, we can hold on to the dead and keep them somehow close to us. But we can't. The dead reach out to where we cannot go, and we must let them go. Memories do not die, they change and change us with them. In this springtime, as we come near to Easter, we remember Jesus who died and rose to live with God. There is no tombstone, no grave of Jesus. In the garden of the resurrection, the angels said to the women who came to grieve over his body, why seek the living among the dead? The living Jesus moves on from his death and takes us with him. His memory changes us from people of the past to the future, from those who mourn to those who might one day dare to rejoice. The Christian mystery embraces death, but does not bow down to it. Beyond and through the cruelty of all that wounds us is the promise of salvation, the hope of everlasting life. Living Lord, you share our sorrows for those we love. Cleanse our imaginations, open the horizons of hope, and set our hearts free to embrace the future where we, with those we love, will look upon love's face forevermore. Father God, in your love for us, you've given us others who've shared our journey of life. Partners, friends, parents, children, and so many, many more. We love them still. They are still part of us. Help us to seek and accept your gentle healing of our hurts. and strength. Help all families and who find themselves in sorrow and distress. Give us wisdom and strength to face days to come.
Almighty God, you know how we feel when we suffer, because in Jesus you experienced suffering and death. But you also raised Jesus from the dead, and through your Spirit you bring hope and new life within our grasp. Heavenly Father, when we feel as if the rug has been pulled out from under our lives, help us instead with Christ to learn to dance on a moving carpet. We pray that as the gospel brings with it a new beginning in our lives, so we may continually share in the glory of a living Lord who loves and cares for us. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amici providing a beautiful end to our program today, except for me to remind you that Angela Tilby's prayers are available on this prayer card that goes with the series. If you'd like one of these, or if you'd just like to share your thoughts with us, we would love to hear from you. Our address is Lent in the Park, BBC, Oxford Road, Manchester, M61SJ. 
or you can email us on lent98 at bbc.co.uk or there is a 24-hour answer phone machine on 0345 44 and don't forget to give us your address because we do need that now next weekend of course it's palm sunday the last program in our series the start of holy week and the start of all sorts of activity here at lime park because the house and gardens finally do open to the public Will it all go smoothly? Well, you can find out by joining me next Sunday. Until then, have a very good week. Bye-bye. Yes, hi, welcome back to the programme. Now, I'm pretty sure that everyone out there has seen the last night of the proms on the television, perhaps listened to it on the radio, but actually being there in person would, of course, mean a costly trip to London. Well, it would have, but not anymore, because the first ever Northern Night at the Proms is coming to this region. And here to tell us all about it are the organiser, John Herdman, and conductor, Raymond uh, Lomax. John, it's your idea. It's a wonderful idea. Tell me the thinking behind it. Well, the thinking behind it basically is the Blackpool Sportsman's Aid in, in Blackpool um, are charity raisers and uh, we've always hung our hats on a charity and we're not reinventing the wheel, we're going back to the original idea of saying to people come and have a very good night. So in other words it's all to raise money, all for, to local raise money charities. for local charities. And what a great venue Blackpool will be a. Eh? There's nobody better. The Opera House is 3,000 seater. It's got the largest stage we put the best music on in the northwest anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Now, so, Raymond, you're the uh, you're the uh, conductor, aren't you? Right, yes. Will be. Yes. That's quite a job because it's you know I mean, such a charismatic figure. The person that sort of leads the crowd, <laughs> leads everybody. I mean, well, yeah, that's right. You've got that's some true. nerves forming already. Not really now. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some good music to play, right. and um, it's a participation for the audience as well, and uh, they can let their hair down at the end. Right. Best music, well-known yeah. tunes. Yeah. Because audience participation uh, is what it's all about, really, isn't it? Well, Everyone's sort good, of going up and down like this. And that's right, yes. Yeah, good reaction. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Enthusiastic. They, they've seen it on the, the television from London. They can come and take part and do it in Blackpool. Yeah. Everybody. John, what sort of charities will you hope to raise money for on the big night? It's in November, isn't it? It's in November. Well, there are lots of local charities in um, in Blackpool and we haven't actually designated anybody. Have you? So basically what we're doing is when we've raised the money then we will take uh, people will write to us yeah. and ask us if we can assist them and it can be hospitals, it can be schools, all it can be places, all absolutely. kinds of places, yeah. even the scouts yeah. and that sort of thing. Raymond, what are your hopes? What do, you, do you think it will become a sort of a, uh, a, something that will happen every year? An I would event? hope so, yes. I would hope we'd, we'd visit Blackpool every year. And just remind us of the date again? The 28th of November. Great. Well, okay. we should be there. Thank you very much indeed, both of you, for coming in tonight. And, of course, we will be hearing from Judith Tinston at the end of the um, programme singing Rule Britannia. Thank you That's very right. much. Yeah. Great. We we'll look forward to that. Thanks okay. very much indeed. Thanks. Okay. We're going to France. Well, I'm sure that debate is going to continue over the next few weeks. No doubt we'll about that. We'll leave you uh, tonight with uh, the stirring sound of Judith Tinston singing Rule Britannia. Yes, it's a taste of what you can hear in Blackpool later this year and uh, very appropriate with the World Cup just nine days away now. So from both of us, have good a very night. good night. Good night. <laughs>